Okay, hello MCC. Uh, I am Jessica Snyder. I am the psychology instructor here, chair of the psychology department. And we organized this presentation because, for a variety of reasons, but uh, a lot of us felt that the information running around online and you know all the different ideas about what's true, what's not true, what's happening, very difficult for people to sift through. And so we thought it would be helpful uh, to have a speaker who is an expert on conspiracy theories. So what we have for you today is uh, Mark Huston. <clears throat> Mark Huston is currently an associate professor and chair of philosophy at Schoolcraft Community College in Livonia, Michigan. He's published articles and essays on the journals Ratio Film and Philosophy, the Journal of Philosophical Research, and in the books Tennis and Philosophy and Golf and Philosophy. He also published book reviews in the magazine Philosophy Now and the journal The Community College Enterprise. In 2012, he received a National Endowment for Humanities Summer Scholar Award as part of the Landmarks of American History and Culture workshops. And in 2016, he received the Roosh Award for Excellence in Teaching. In addition, Mark has given numerous talks on conspiracy theories, both locally and nationally, including the keynote address at the 2015 Forest Park International Festival in St. Louis Community College. His most recent publications include Medical Conspiracy Theories and Medical Errors in the journal, International Journal of Applied Philosophy, Beyond Apocalypse Now, Just War Theory and Existentialism in the journal Community College Humanities Review, and The Greatest Conspiracy Theory Movies in the book Conspiracy Theories, Philosophers Connect the Dots. So we're very appreciative that Mark is here with us here today, and we're going to throw it over to him, and he will talk a little bit about conspiracy theories. Mark? To you. All right, thank you. I'm going to pull up my PowerPoint here and then hopefully everything will work smoothly and <laughs> we'll have a nice conversation. So, um, all right, give me, well, there it is. Okay, hopefully it's coming. All right, I hope you all can see this. So the title is Everything is Under Control. Um, it's taking a second to boot up here. So yes, I've been talking about conspiracy theories for quite a while. Uh, Sorry, let me get this slideshow going, hopefully. Everything's taking its time today, so, but that's okay. Uh, okay, my screen just went completely blank. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Uh, there we go. Okay. So, uh, let's see. This is the book that was just mentioned, and I will make it very clear to you. Uh, I get absolutely no money from my essay in this book, so... But if you are interested in just a general philosophical take on conspiracy theories, this is a pretty nice collection that just came out this year. And I have the second essay in here on the greatest conspiracy theory movies. Towards the end of the talk, if we have time, I might even um, uh, talk a little bit about the movies if you'd like to, but we'll see where we're at because I want to give some general information. I think these are very important. I got interested in these conspiracy theories as a result of movies and fiction. Uh, much of the 60s and 70s, uh, some of the great fiction by writers such as Thomas Pynchon and um, Don DeLillo are conspiracy theory novels and Ishmael Reed. And what once was mostly in the arena of fiction or JFK conspiracy theories now is just blossom and balloon. But to be clear, and I think this is important, Conspiracy theories have always sort of been part of the DNA of the United States. And this is the article that was mentioned. So, and these are some important works. In terms of this idea that it's been part of our history, this top essay, The Paranoid Style in American Politics uh, from 1963, was actually in Harper's Magazine originally by the uh, award-winning historian Richard Hofstetter. And in this essay, he lays out how not only have conspiracy theories uh, were influential at the time he was writing it, but how they've been sort of part of America from the founding. Um, in many ways, you can actually see some of the buildup to declaring um, our independence from England in part as conspiratorial thinking, because a lot of it was way overblown and not nearly as bad in terms of what we would think. So you had that, and then not almost immediately after our founding, you had a series of conspiracy theories going through the United States about sort of two groups in particular, Catholics and Freemasons, very early on. In fact, 
the Freemason conspiracy theories were so bad and so worrisome to many people in the American public that they started, they were in fact anti-Freemason political parties. That was the actual name of the political party, the anti-Freemasons. The anti-Freemasons almost won the governorship in Massachusetts, as a matter of fact. So they were quite substantial for a sort of short amount of time. But that's just to give you an idea that this is not new. The way it's presented obviously is new and sort of the overabundance is new. But just the idea of conspiracy theorizing is not even remotely new. So just as a sort of lead up these are, this is an older list now. There's obviously new ones we could talk about. And I'm happy to talk about individual conspiracy theories. Uh, there are so many out there, you can't really keep up on all of them, okay? But I do my best to try to have some idea. But this is from a list from Time Magazine a few years ago. And many of these are still quite popular. Of course, the sort of granddaddy of modern conspiracy theorizing is the JFK assassination. I'm sure you're all familiar with this. I believe even up to this point, well over 50% of American citizens believe that JFK was not killed solely by Oswald. So uh, that percentage, by the way, went up drastically after the movie JFK came out in the early 90s. So up to that point, it was around 35%, and it, it well doubled beyond that. So it was right after the movie came out, it was around 70%. Now, that's important because it shows how influenced we can be even if the work is, I won't say completely fictional, but the movie JFK, if you watch it, I love that movie, but you know, it's fundamentally incoherent in its presentation. And it shouldn't be that convincing, but it is to many people. Of course, 9-11, you're probably familiar with some of those conspiracies. There's, there are a variety of them, but they boil down to either that the Bush administration knew or even caused 9-11. In fact, this is the reason I started teaching these in class in the sense of trying to grapple with the idea of conspiracy theories because so many people believe in the 9-11 conspiracy theories even though there's overwhelming evidence against them. Of course, aliens are always fun. Paul is dead, if you know the Beatles. Sometimes talking to younger students, I'm not sure always, but, um, but the reason Paul is dead, so this is the idea that Paul McCartney died in a car crash in the 1960s and that he was replaced by a doppelganger. But that conspiracy theory actually started here in Michigan, out of Ann Arbor. So I like bringing up that one. Of course, secret societies, I already mentioned the Freemasons. There's tons of these secret societies that are supposed to be the rulers. One of the sort of placeholder terms is the Illuminati. You probably, many of you have heard that term. There is no Illuminati, by the way, just to let you know. But um, it's usually just the term used for whoever you think is in control. That's not the obvious group. Uh, moon landings are fake. This one has gotten a lot of traction. I find it particularly frustrating one, but it's gotten a lot of traction, I'd say, in the last 20 years. Interestingly, in the 70s, that was not a big conspiracy theory. In the 70s, the bigger conspiracy theory was not only had we already landed on the moon, but we actually had a, a landing pad on the dark side of the moon for aliens that we were up there in contact with them. So it was sort of the other part of 2001, A Space Odyssey, not the idea that Kubrick faked uh, the moon landing. But there's that. And of course, I won't go through all these, but CIA... Uh, there's tons related to CIA. We can come back to that if you'd like. And then the reptilian elite, this is one uh, we can mention in a minute. But so this is a list I just worked up at one point just quickly, and then I've added to it over time for this these kinds of talks. And one of the things we're going to talk about is how to sort of conceptually analyze conspiracy theories. And then we that's why you can see here it says conspiracies are accepted as true. Tuskegee, Watergate, MK Ultra, Iran Contra. Some that I'd say at least you can see why people would conspiracy theorize about them. So some of these assassinations, there is a lot of strange evidence about say JFK or even RFK or, or Martin Luther King. Of course, Pearl Harbor, the famous one, I don't think this one's really um, up for dispute, but plenty of people think that FDR knew ahead of time there's pretty good reason to think that's completely false. But, and then there are a lot of Jonestown, you know, Jonestown, of course, is where we famously got the sort of horrible phrase, drinking the Kool-Aid, because of the uh, people who were his followers, 
Jim Jones's followers who drank the Kool-Aid to kill themselves when they thought the government was going to come and try to either bring them back or arrest them. They were in Guyana at the time, but they had killed uh, Leo Ryan, who was a uh, um, congr congressman at the time, who I believe to this day is the only congressman to have ever been killed in the line of duty. He was assassinated by them as he was trying to fly back home. And that's what launched the drinking of the Kool-Aid that caused them to commit suicide. Many of them, not all of them, a lot of them were shot. Um, but a lot of uh, the conspiracy theories have to do with the idea that Jim Jones actually worked for the CIA. And he was part of the MK Ultra program. And so he was using that to try to mind control his followers. Of course, Oklahoma City, um, uh, interestingly, if you look at the Oklahoma City conspiracy theories and the 9-11 conspiracy theories, they very much mirror each other. They look almost exactly alike in many cases, um, which should worry you if you're trying to actually reason well about these things, because 9-11 is a completely different event in Oklahoma City, yet the conspiracy theories run along very parallel lines. Um, so these are some of the groups that get you know, accused of being in control at various times, so like the Knights Templar, the Illuminati, uh, Council on Foreign Relations is a big one, the Rockefellers, you know, so I'm not going to go through all those, but there's some. And then I have some miscellaneous ones here. Groom Lake or Area 51, that's the aliens. People like the aliens. Uh, I even have a have a family member who's really fond of alien conspiracy theories. Chemtrails is one that seems to have really taken off about, it's been around for a while, but about 10 years ago, it really seemed to start taking off. I started hearing about it a lot. Harp, that's an interesting one. This is the one that's used to, so, HARP is a real project as part of DARPA, which is Defense Agency Research Projects, sort of the mad scientist wing of the Pentagon. And HARP is the, uh, it's called the High Frequency Active Auroral Research Program. It's in Alaska. They have an outpost there and they do research on the ionosphere and the atmosphere. But um, what the conspiracy theorists claim is that not only are they trying to control the weather, they are cre creating weather weapons. So almost every major weather event that's occurred, I'd say in the last 15 years, there's some claim or other that HARP was the cause. So if you remember the tsunami several years ago, the earthquake in Haiti, the, earth the tsunami that caused the um, eventually the chain reaction that caused the nuclear reaction in Japan, all of these uh, the conspiracy theorists claim, in fact, were intentionally caused. They were not accidents of nature. They were caused directly by the use of a harp machine, some sort of weapon that creates weather events. Um, Jade Helm, Project Bluebeam, these are ones you may or may not have heard of. Of course, Pizza Kate, QAnon, Wayfair. There's all these conspiracy theories about COVID right now. Right, this goes on. Um, Although this is from 2013, many of these stats haven't changed significantly. The trick would be you could add new ones in here. But again, you can see 50% at least believe JFK, JFK was killed by conspiracy theory. Global warming is host, 37%. Aliens exist, 30%. This idea of a new world order, 28%. But when you translate to the sheer numbers, that's where I think it, it gets interesting. Um, the fact the vaccine one has, has increased. Um, it's more than 20% now. Uh, but lizard people control politics. That's um, I, the reptilian elite. So it's at least four or five percent of the population, which, which is around, you know, 13 million people. 13 million people believe that the government's controlled by shape shifting either interdimensional or interstellar lizard people. <laughs> so that's one I really have trouble understanding. So one of the things you want to do if you're trying to really take seriously this this sort of phenomenon of conspiracy theories and, and something not just in philosophy but I think across the board in academics you want to try to do is give a conceptual analysis one that is fair that in the sense that it, it both addresses how the term is used in ordinary language but also is somewhat neutral so that you can give an actual analysis because the problem is of course and I, I'm sure you're all aware of this is the way the term is often used in, say, especially a political forum, is to merely degrade and uh, just dismiss whoever it is you're accusing of conspiracy theorizing. 
So on that model, that means if you accuse someone of, of conspiracy theorizing and you, you claim that a certain view they hold is a conspiracy theory, you're using it just to dismiss the view, right? It's just merely a dismissive term. Now, from an academic standpoint, that's not particularly useful because what it means is by definition, all of it, all conspiracy theories must be automatically bad reasoning. But of course, to assume that would be to make the merry mistake many conspiracy theorists do make, right? Is that, that you already know what's going on and you don't need to investigate. And that's something we don't wanna do if you're trying to do a serious academic approach. But nonetheless, you still have to recognize how the term is used to some degree and try to find some, some room for maneuvering there. So there are a number of explanations that all run similar to this one. Um, I'm gonna give you mine in a minute. This is from an essay by Brian Keeley. It's a very famous essay in the Journal of Philosophy from the late 90s. You probably have read it already by the, since I've been talking. Um, these are some other ones. Michael Barcoon, Cass Sunstein and Vermeil, Peter Mandick. Well, the trick is what happens is that these attempted academic definitions or conceptual analyses run on a sort of gamut where they either are, they can be quite narrow and really make it seem like all conspiracy theories are, are bad reasoning, which I don't think you should automatically do. Or they're too broad. So if you look at the bottom one here by Charles Pigeon, it says simply a theory that posits a conspiracy, a secret plan on the part of the some group to influence events partly by secret means. Well, I think that's too broad because then you're going to get pretty much any kind of crime activity in which two people are, are working together as a conspiracy of that sort. But that really doesn't capture the way the term is used in the language. So one of my favorite philosophers is a philosopher named Ludwig Wittgenstein. And he has this way of trying to make sense of concepts that is not a strict definition, but uses what are called paradigm cases and a sort of similarity heuristic so you get the core cases, and then if some new case comes along, you see how close it is to that case. And if it's close enough, you say, well, this would be, say, a conspiracy theory as opposed to some other kind of theory, a social theory, for example. So, and this is a quote from my own essay. I know it's a little cheesy to do this, but it's just easier. <laughs> so from my own essay in the um, book that has the uh, movie essay in it. So here's how I understand conspiracy theories. They usually explain historical events. They tend to run counter to the received or official view from the relevant authorities. They are typically driven by the intentions of a smallish group of conspirators. The intentions are for evil purposes. The conspirators operate in secret. That's why there's so many secret societies like the Illuminati that are proposed. And they provide a narrative that can explain events that otherwise seem disconnect, disconnected or irrelevant. Right, so the idea is that if you have some purported understanding of the world or explanation of what's going on in the world, that if that explanation has some chunk of these criteria, we'll say it's conspiracy theory. If it doesn't, then it's a different type of theory, scientific, historical, political, so on. So that's the idea. And that way, when you look at something new, because there are gonna be, I will say, conspiracy theories that are true, Conspiracy theories that are clearly false and some that fall in between, all right? And that's why that list I had earlier. So conspiracy theories, theories of events that are we know are true, like the horrible Tuskegee experiment, the Iran-Contra affair, Watergate. If you look at those before every all the information has completely come out, the way they're described, they meet these criteria. It's behind the scenes, nefarious intentions, a small group of people influencing a larger group, all the criteria are met. So to claim those are not conspiracy theories is to just want to define away the problem. And that's not even remotely intellectually interesting. So you, you clearly have true cases that are conspiracy theories, but you also have, I think, pretty obviously false ones. I think the shape-shifting reptile ones we can pretty easily dismiss, or one of the and I honestly am trying to figure out how this one's made a sort of comeback, but the idea that the earth is flat has seemed to have resurged of late, and uh, it's hard to understand that one, but I think that one you can easily dismiss out of hand. 
But then there's are plenty in between, like the JFK assassination, where you know there's a lot of uh, crazy evidence that needs to be accounted for. Um, Oswald's shooting of Kennedy is a tricky shot, right? So you can see why there's a reasonable discussion to be had there. So you don't want to dismiss that out of hand. All right. Here's why I like my own account, but we'll we'll move on from there. So one of the even tricky parts about talking in terms of conspiracy theories is just the term theory itself. So theory means different things in different contexts. In science theory, if something raises the level of theory, it really means it's accepted as true or really close to the truth. So this is why you might talk about gravitational theory or the theory of evolution. These are things that are accepted as scientific truths. And the way theory is often used in ordinary language is to mean something that's up for grabs. Oh, that's just my theory, right? That's not something you would ever say in science. Oh, that's just my theory. You wouldn't be dismissive that way. So what, what are you really getting at when you say something is just a theory? It's what a, a good scientist would say is a hypothesis, something that is still up for grabs. A hypothesis is what's still up for grabs. A theory is something that's accepted as at least highly likely, if not true, by the body of scientific evidence. All right. So the so if you recognize that, then that helps to start to pick out some of the criteria for better and worse explanations. What kinds of things provide better explanations of the world? And what are some of those criteria? Well, one of the most famous thinkers to deal with this is, is this philosopher of science named Karl Popper, who started in sort of the early, early to, to the mid 20th century. And he gives, you know, and sort of the two big philosophers of science of the 20th century are Karl Popper and Thomas Kuhn. But it's Popper's work that is of particular interest to us. So he talks about the idea of how science changes or grows. And the key idea he provides is this idea of falsifiability. Now, falsifiability, I would say, is if you ask working scientists to think about this, the sort of philosophy of science, it's almost the key, some version of this is the key thing they'll say is important to have a potential theory of the world that is falsifiable. And your job as a, as a good scientist, but not just a scientist, a good thinker, anyone who's trying to make sense of the world and provide an explanation, a theory, if you will, that theory has to be falsifiable in principle. Doesn't mean it's falsified. If it's falsified, then it's not a good theory, right? but it has to be potentially falsified. So the way that the fancy phrase for this is there must exist a logically possible observation statement that is inconsistent with the hypothesis. In other words, if I make a prediction about what's supposed to happen and then that prediction doesn't bear out, that's good reason for me to think there's something wrong with my theory, right? So this is something that unfortunately gets often dismissed in the conspiracy theories that don't work particularly well. So, you know, one of the big ones is QAnon, right? People talk about all the time. Well, if you actually look at Q and the predictions Q makes, almost all of them have turned out to be false. So on any normal understanding of explanation, no one would buy it. It's, it's more like a horoscope at that point where you're just fitting in whatever you want into the view. But, but Q has made predictions. In fact, you can look, if you trace the history of Q, you can see how early on there were specific predictions that actually turned out to be false, like Mueller was working with Trump, things like that. And so Q switched and just started doing very general things. You know, something big's going to happen next week, that kind of thing, which is just like horoscope talk, right? You know, I can make anything seem true if I make it vague enough, right? I can predict something about all of you right now. In 30 seconds, you'll be breathing oxygen. My profit? No. Easy, right? So to be very wary of these things. So if it's not falsifiable, it's not a legitimate theory of the world. So a lot of, for example, metaphysical theories are not falsifiable in this sense. And this is why you have to be careful with those. Um, so certain, you know, many religious theories are not traditionally falsifiable. So when thinking about conspiracy theories then, if they're supposed to be theories about the world, and not just something taken on faith or just understood to be a narrative you're telling, then they need to be falsifiable, which means you need to be able to say 
if you're trying to hold the view rationally, what could I observe that if that were true would show that I'm wrong? If you can't find that in principle, you are not talking about the world anymore. You're telling a story, okay? So these are some of the things we need to be careful of and watch out for as we um, look at conspiracy theories. And again, remember, I believe there are true conspiracy theories, but I think they have to raise to a very high level of evidential standards and they are falsifiable. So what, some of the problems of conspiracy theories when they are problematic, which they often are, are, these are some of those things. So often conspiracy theories rest a lot more on authority. See, people think science rests on authority, but it actually doesn't, right? It's just authority does the interpretation for us because good scientific theories are so hard for, for the layman to understand. That's why it takes expertise. And this is why, you know, it, it's sort of recognized that you should accept the body of expertise. But it's not because, it's not just the experts telling you this, it's because of the research and the evidence. So it's really the evidence that's important. And it's just the, the experts are, have the, the access to the evidence to help us understand it. Um, Non-repeatable experiments or hand-picked examples. This is a big problem with conspiracy theorizing. We're going to return to this idea. There's a number of ways this gets picked out. Another term is confirmation bias. I'm going to come back to that in a bit. An unwillingness to test, right? To really put it up to scrutiny. Someone starts challenging you, you're like, you just don't want to hear it. Well, that's a problem. If you're serious, but trying to explain something, especially something that's important in the world, you need to be willing to be critiqued. And if you can't defend it, you should probably not believe it. Um, and of course, one of the real problems is disregarding refuting information. This is a main sort of trend in bad theorizing. If, if something that shows why you're wrong, you, if you just dismiss it out of hand, again, you're not really trying to make sense of the world anymore. You're just telling yourself a story that doesn't really relate to the world. Uh, now, these fallacies, and if you know the term fallacy, this, it, fallacy doesn't mean false, by the way. It, it just means a mistake in reasoning, something we talk about in logic. So one of the key ones that occurs, I think, often with um, the way conspiracy theories are presented is what is called false dilemma. So that's a very specific kind of fallacy. So what is a false dilemma? False dilemma is one that says, if I corner you into thinking that there are only two options, either option A or option B, and I convince you that option A doesn't work, the only thing you can be left with then is option B. How does this relate to conspiracy theorists? Often conspiracy theorists will, will say, look, whatever the mainstream view is that is being given to us, is wrong, uh, you know, because the government's deceiving us or the politicians are or something along those lines. And then they propose the conspiracy theory as the alternative view about whatever the event is. So like 9-11 is a good example of this. So, right, what the conspiracy theorist says is, you know, the Bush administration says this is what happened on 9-11, but there seems to be all these problems with their uh, understanding of the event and we know they've lied to us in other ways so therefore you should accept that they caused it the conspiracy theory what I'm hoping you're grasping here is there are a lot of steps in between there so one of the tricks for example in 9-11 conspiracy theory is in fact there was there were problems so during the 9-11 Commission report we know that the Bush administration tried to stymie some of the uh, attempted gathering of evidence for the 9-11 Commission report. Now, what the conspiracy theorist says is, well, that proves that they're covering up their own causing of 9-11. But actually, if you look at the body of evidence, that's not what was happening at all. In fact, it's almost the opposite of that. What they were covering up was how poorly they did on the lead up to 9-11. In fact, what they're covering up were the mistakes. So there were all these intelligence breakdowns and the Bush administration was fundamentally embarrassed by how bad things had gotten because they reduced Richard Clark from a cabinet position. They hadn't listened to him very well. Uh, the FBI and the CIA did not talk to each other, so they lost people coming over. So there's all these errors that occurred. And that's what the 9-11 commission report was digging up was all these mistakes. So what the Bush administration was covering up was how inept they were. 
The conspiracy theorist says, no, they were very apt. They could do everything, right? They could control bringing down three buildings. Now, here's the trick. If the conspiracy theorist says to you, you're being gullible because you're listening to everything the government is saying, right? You can say, no, I'm not. You can be skeptical of what the government says without saying, therefore, I must believe this other thing. In fact, the better bet is just to be skeptical. But don't jump into this other theory, which has even less evidence for it. That's worse. So, you know, if you're not forced into believing something you're not sure about, be skeptical and leave it at that. That's a better, better cognitive attitude. Here are a few more distinctions that, you know, if you're sort of really getting into the <laughs> academic literature on conspiracy theories. So we have super conspiracies, systemic conspiracies, and event conspiracies. So if you think of events, it would be like a one-off, like a 9-11 or a JFK assassination, something like that. Now, <clears throat> when people actually conspiracy theorize, they're mostly at the systemic level. Because, so this is one of the uh, psychological characteristics that has been most well-established in, in relation to conspiracy theorizing, which is the idea that people rarely believe in just one conspiracy theory, right? So it, theoretically, you could be someone who thinks, well, there's something messed up about 9-11, but in general, you're not into conspiracy theories. But what has been shown repeatedly in many psychological studies is it's sort of like a gateway drug effect. Once someone believes in one conspiracy theory, the likelihood they believe in other conspiracy theories goes up to like 80 or 90 percent. It's overwhelming. It's sort of like you open the door to rejecting a certain kind of uh, normal epistemological approach to the world. And once you've done that, the floodgates open and you're way more prone to believe other things that even have less persuasiveness to them. So that's why you get to the systemic level, because if you don't believe any of the sort of mainstream epistemic understandings we have of the world, what are the options? Well, there must be other groups that in fact are controlling things or causing things, right? And so that's where you get the systemic level. The super conspiracies, these are like David Icke, the guy listed here, he's the guy who talks about the reptiles. So he, he folds in every conspiracy you can think of and just claims the reptiles are shape shifting and they're, it's ridiculous. But that they do, you know, they can be the Bushes or the royal family and they cause all these things in the world. He, he really says these things. Um, so the systemic ones are the more interesting, right? Because there really are some of these groups. I mean, the Knights of Malta exist. Of course, the CIA exists. The Freemasons exist. And they have done things, right? The Freemasons in the sense that there have been presidents that were Freemasons. Now, the role that has played in terms of any significant events is it was radically unclear and probably not very likely, but nonetheless, there are in fact at least Freemasons, so it's not a total illusion. The Illuminati, you know, people love to talk about the Illuminati, but they don't exist. The Illuminati existed historically very briefly in, um, from 1776 for about 12 years, so about to 1788 or so. And they were started by this Jesuit priest named Adam Weishfeld, who blended sort of Freemasonic ideas with some other Enlightenment ideas and was trying to create a sort of free thinking group in Bavaria. And so the original group's name was the Bavarian Illuminati. And they were very much like the Freemasons. And then they disbanded. That's it. That is the Illuminati. What happened is in the 20th century, certain groups, in particular the John Birch Society, who initially was sort of this rabid anti-communist group, when communism started to die out as a serious threat after the 1950s, they shifted to this idea of the Illuminati. And they really started promoting it. And what it became is just a placeholder for whoever either you don't like or whoever you think is doing the bad stuff. So it's, it's virtually meaningless. It's really just a placeholder term. All right. But one of the things I think is funny is Jay-Z has played up on this idea a lot. So he has clothing related to Illuminati and everything else. All right. So some principles. This is a book called The Culture of Conspiracy. If you're interested in academic work on conspiracy, this is a particularly good book. And the author is Michael Barcoon. He suggests 
these three principles that you find in conspiracy theories, particularly what I would say are the bad ones, nothing happens by accident. Nothing is as it seems and everything is connected. We're gonna keep going from here because these ideas can be reworked in a number of different ways of discussing them, but, but the core feature here is that whatever you're being presented as the mainstream view is, is not only false, it's a sort of cover up. And that what the conspiracy theorists can do is see through that veil and pick out these patterns and put together these incidents that may seem disconnected to the untrained eye, but that they find. And so one of the most frustrating parts, and you're seeing it right now, is nothing happens by accident. Of course, if you live a normal human life, I assume you've made plenty of mistakes, as have I. Well, this doesn't just happen at the individual level. It happens all the time at institutional levels. But the conspiracy theorist never sees a mistake. Everything is intentional. Everything is nefarious. There is no coincidence, right? Someone can not just accidentally drop something. It's them purposely throwing it away. Always, always. Now that's a problem because it belies human nature and it belies any reasonable explanation that you would normally give in, a, in another context. So one of the things, I'm not gonna go deeply into this slide, but one of the concerns I have and I'm following a philosopher named Kazim Kassam is the idea, so maybe you've heard of virtue ethics, which is this very old branch of ethics that goes back to the ancient Greeks. Well, sort of uh, adapting that idea, there's been a general creation of what's called virtue and vice epistemology. So, so instead of just talking about the aspects of the theory that's out there in the world, you can discuss our own mental attitudes about how to make sense of the world. And so one of the things that Kassam talks about is trying to create a sort of general personal personality makeup, if you will, where you engage in epistemic virtues, good ways of making sense of the world, and try to limit your vices, like fallacies, fallacious reasoning. Because the goal is to, to try to create effective and responsible inquiry. Now, this doesn't mean you're always going to get it right, but we know there are sort of better and worth, worse ways to make sense of the world. So if you just make up a story and then fit everything into your preconceived notions, that's not a good way to make sense of the world. But if you generate a hypothesis that you recognize could clearly be wrong and that you recognize also the sets of kinds of things that could falsify it, and insofar as you try to falsify it and it withstands scrutiny, that is a responsible way to try to make sense of the world and especially of major events in the world. And so this idea is sometimes called virtue epistemology or vice epistemology, which would be the attempt to recognize the kinds of vices we are committed to. And the way Kassam describes it is a conspiracist mentality. And, and this, by the way, is a term that's gaining a lot more traction in academic literature. So even moving away from calling someone, say, a conspiracy theorist, which we've already said there can be true conspiracy theories, sort of the sort of more negative approach is this idea of a conspiracist and a conspiracist mentality, where you automatically go to conspiracy to explain everything. So you're not even attempting to explain it in any sort of ordinary epistemological process. You just go right to the conspiracy theories. And so the way Kassam puts it, it's the general propensity to, to subscribe to theories blaming conspiracy of ill-intending individuals or groups for important societal phenomenon, right? The most obvious kind of case where this is extreme is in the case of natural disasters. Like I said, like a Hawaiian, uh, the earthquake that hit Haiti or the tsunami. To, to move directly to that, to that there must be a weapon that is generating underwater earthquakes to cause tsunamis would seem like a leap to most of us. But to the conspiracist, the one who has a conspiracy mentality, that's the first place they're going to look because they're like, well, that's too big of an event. That's too devastating. So it must be this other thing, right? It must be this, this intentional action by some nefarious group here for time. Oh, OK, let me wrap this up here in a minute so we have some time for questions. So let me just talk about a few of the ways we might make mistakes in reasoning. So and this is really linked to our deep psychology and our evolutionary psychology. So we are pattern, not just pattern seekers in the world. We are pattern generators. 
But because of that, so, you know, we have a whole subsection of our brain devoted just to recognizing faces. But what that does is overgenerate our ability to see faces. This is why you see faces in clouds or in on mountain sites, right? Well, that's just a pattern you're creating. It's not a real pattern because these things happen randomly. It's a pattern you're generating. Well, that's what a conspiracy theory often is. It's a pattern we generate. It's not really the pattern out there. It's one we've generated. So you gotta be very careful about that because we have a tendency to do that anyway. And it turns out there have been, you know, quite a few studies on this now. If we are afraid, if we are in a fear state, this ratchets up our likelihood of finding a pattern, finding, actually generating one. They've done studies where they have randomized array, sort of like Rorschach tests. And, you know, as it is, people are 40 to 50% likely to find a pattern where there isn't one. But if you put them into a state of fear or anxiety beforehand, that goes up to like 75%. And of course, conspiracy theories are generated in relation to things that people are afraid of in society, right? So these are, this is from a fairly recent work, so these are three mental processes that prone us to conspiracy theorizing. So this is something we all have. We all have these cognitive biases, but if you sort of let them run rampant and you don't control them or really take them seriously and critically analyze them, these, these are what help generate conspiracy theories. So intentionality, so this is related to the agenticity that we talked about in the last time, but this is the idea that you're always assuming actions are intentional. So as a fallacy, this is called the fundamental attribution error, which is the tendency to overestimate the effect of disposition or intention or personality and underestimate the effect of the situation in explaining social behavior. The easy example I always give of this, right? You're driving down the highway, someone cuts you off, you get super angry, you're like, why would you do that to me? You know, that's saying it's intentional and there's a very good chance the person just didn't see you. They're in their own space. They have no idea they cut you off, right? That's what a lot of social behavior is. But if you go to that first one, just write that large and you're doing conspiracy theorizing. Proportionality. We think important events demand causes that are commensurate. JFK is the most easy example. How could this guy, Oswald, who seems like a loser, seems just disenfranchised, actually kill the president, right? The most important person in the world. It's gotta be a conspiracy, right? No, it doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't. And then confirmation bias, and this is a big one, and this is something we all have to fight against. I have to fight against it, we all do. And unfortunately, this is something we've always been prone to, and it's much easier now because of the way we have silos and the way we get information through all these different technological means, right? Where you sign up or you watch news stations that just reflect your, your position. A lot of people don't seek out alternative views. Well, the problem is that already plays into something we already do anyway, which is called confirmation bias. Assimilating new information that confirms what we already think and disregarding contradictory information, right? In other words, this is what not falsification, the opposite of falsification. Falsification is where you seek out contradictory information if it's there to see if your views withhold scrutiny. But confirmation bias says, I'll take in the information that fits with the pattern I've already judged about the world. Anything that goes against that, you know, I'm not going to even look at it, right? And with the social media that we have now, it's so much easier. And that's scary. And that's one of the big problems. All right. So I think I'll stop there for the moment since it's 1245. These are some movies if you have any interest, you want to go a little more lighthearted with conspiracy theories. And in my essay in the book, I talk about the parallax view in particular, and some about JFK as well. Um, and I could talk more about that if you'd like, but I don't have to. So I think um, I think that's good for now. Uh, I'm happy to entertain some questions or comments. Yeah, Mark, thanks I can't a lot. see Connor, anything. Thanks a lot. <laughs> mentioned questions. If you do have a question that you'd like to leave, uh, you can enter that uh, in the question box now, and we'll make sure that Mark sees that and uh, gets you an answer. I mean, I can also just keep talking. <laughs> so it's, it's, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's and that's fine until until questions roll in. Okay. Um, well, 
if you'd like, I, I could talk a little bit about conspiracy theory books and movies um, because they actually were sort of the first round of, I think, popular conspiracy theorizing in many ways. I mean, you can, like I said, you can trace it in historical circumstances, like the work by Hofstetter. But in general, the conspiracy theories we tend to be exposed to came through like novels, for example. So early on, you have like a book like Crying of Lot 49 by Thomas Pynchon. And of course, more recent ones like The Da Vinci Code is a big one, right? Many of you are familiar with that probably. It's not a personal favorite of mine. I think the book's pretty lousy, but um, it's it's fine. It, it actually steals a lot from this book called Holy Blood, Holy Grail, which was written in England in the late 70s. In fact, it stole so much that the authors of that book sued the author of the Vinci Code. However, they didn't win the suit because they had presented it as history and you can't plagiarize history, even though most people dismiss it. But it was the idea that Jesus did not die on the cross. He had a child with Mary Magdalene and that to this day, uh, there's a bloodline directly from Christ and that you can reinterpret sort of every major event in the world has the ba a battle between the Vatican and the um, uh, original bloodline of Christ because the Vatican wants to hold power, so they have to keep promoting the idea that Christ actually died on the cross. Um, believe it or not, I live in Ferndale, and one of the first conspiracy groups to promote this idea is a group called A. Albionic in the 80s, and it started here in Ferndale which I always find sort of strange and interesting because I don't know why for people would be worried about the royal family, but so be it. Um, so, so I think fiction, the way it worked in fiction was interesting because for, for novelists, it actually was used to make us sort of question how we make sense of the world. And it was very, used very much in postmodern literature. And then in movies, of course, thrillers are very effective. And I think conspiracy theory movies, when they're done right, are one of the most effective type of thrillers. So that's why the parallax view is so good. And that's why um, something like the uh, uh, JFK can work very effectively is because it puts us in this sort of state of paranoia and agitation. And if it's shot well, which I think the parallax view is absolutely shot well, and All the President's Men is the other one, same director. Uh, it puts you in the state where you're disconcerted. So it can have a powerful emotional effect. And so they're very, that's, that's, they're very effective, right? And then in the 90s, we start getting most famously the X-Files. And the X-Files, you can show statistically increases in beliefs in all kinds of things, especially aliens, after the X-Files comes out. So popular culture has had a very serious effect on this. So it's not the only thing, but it's had a very serious effect. Of course, technology has too. So what you, yeah, okay, good. <laughs> I can't hear you. I'll unmute <laughs> myself. We actually had a question that just rolled in. Uh, what are the similarities and differences between conspiracy theories and religions? It seems like there are some similarities between the two. So that's a good question. I get that question quite a bit actually. So, um, and I think the similarities unfortunately have gotten closer over time. Now, Let's just talk about the obvious difference. The difference at least is supposed to be that religion gives us a metaphysical view, right? A view about the ontology of the universe. And so that's not like a conspiracy theory because conspiracy theories are supposed to be contingent explanations of events that happen in the ordinary world. So they're very different in that sense. But in terms of the reasoning, if you are trying to argue what has happened over time with conspiracy theories is that, and this is where the similarity can come in, often they, they become such a part of a worldview that it's very hard to penetrate, so much so that you might as well say the beliefs are accepted on faith because there is no counter evidence that can puncture it. So if you're in a position where you can't find the counter evidence, you need to worry about how your belief set is structured because it's very much like a faith belief, right? I mean. If someone challenges uh, someone who's a full-on believer in a religious position, and you say, well, here's why I don't believe in God or whatever it is, they're not likely to say, you know what, you're right. <laughs> you got me, right? No, they're going to say, no, you're completely wrong. And not only that, I don't even need to listen to you. Okay, fine. By definition, many religious positions say you should have a faith belief. They have a whole analysis of this. 
That's not supposed to be the case with conspiracy theories, but it has become that. And that's that's a real problem because what it does, it makes it very difficult to have conversations. One of the things they've shown through various kinds of cognitive psychological um, studies is that when someone challenges someone who has one of these deeply held beliefs, not only, even if you're giving very good counter evidence, not only do they not listen to it, it actually strengthens their belief on the other side, which is quite horrifying. Because what that does is just nullifies the chance to have any kind of rational discussion. I don't think you should resist trying to talk to people, but but it makes it harder and you have to be very careful the way you do it. I, I'd recommend, there's a guy named Mick West who has a book called Escaping the Rabbit Hole, who talks about how you can try to actually have sort of rational conversations about these things, which is not easy um, on either side, actually. So was there another question or? Yeah, there's actually a, a few more that have rolled in. Oh, okay. well, I'll stop talking so much then. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you got, we have one uh, in the Teams area and we also have one from Facebook. So I'll see if we can get to those. Uh, so the next one is, so how do we convince people to not believe in these conspiracy theories? Well, I think it's, you know, I don't have a good answer to this because if I did, I could make a whole bunch of money and go on a real speaking tour and, and because this is something that a lot of people question. I think, well, one step though is if you find out someone you're close to seems to really start believing something that seems to be fundamentally irrational, if you catch them early and you don't, you're not, you don't have to be, and don't be jerky about it. Just say, you know, here's some counter, you know, here's some other, say, uh, counter articles to, to the thing you hold. This has shown to be effective early on where people sort of just start being skeptical just in general, which I think is a perfectly reasonable attitude. If they are deeply ensconced, the problem is this is where it becomes a lot like religion as well. Many of these conspiracy groups have created online communities. So there it becomes quite tricky and it's almost cult-like. So it's very hard to penetrate that. So if it gets to that stage, I could say look up how, how to get someone out of a cult because that's what it's more like. That's in the deep, dark parts of it. Um, and and I'm not joking. I mean, this is literally how people talk about it in the literature. Um, that's much more difficult. But if you get people on the other end, you sort of say, well, reason with them. Say, you know, I understand why you think this, but here's something to think about. You can penetrate it some, but I don't have any great answer, unfortunately, for that. So. All right, Mark. Uh, Emily says, Mark, awesome presentation. I'm wondering if you could talk more about social media. It seems like so many of us get our news through digital platforms like Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. I'm wondering how we can avoid confirmation bias in the world of 24-7 digital news. <laughs> also, what role do you think Facebook should have in monitoring conspiracy theories and fake news online? Wow, that's a big question, and I don't know that I have a great answer for you. Um, in terms of the technology, it's un there's no doubt that it's it's radically increased conspiracy theories in the world because you have allowed like-minded people to start conversing and then trading information in a way they never could before, right? So, so that's a big thing. Most a lot of the real modern conspiracies started on sort of fringe parts of the web and sort of migrated. So, like PizzaGate and QAnon started on the chans like 4chan and 8chan um pizzagate came sort of spun out of this thing called gamergate on 4chan and then um the q started on 4chan and migrated to 8chan right so uh you've got technology is a huge part of this now you add in facebook and this is the way people can silo now it's hard and now so i don't have a good answer but there has been some interesting movement, I think, in terms of some people thinking about, especially things like Facebook, some of the really dominant social media groups. Because one of the problems is early on when these groups came in, they were not treated like other kinds of media. So they have no responsibility to the truth, right? Newspapers have responsibility to the truth. News stations do, it's when they're presenting the news and not the opinion part, right? But with Facebook and some of these other platforms, they're they are not under those same legal restrictions so so they're allowed to put out misinformation with no penalty of any real sort right and we've seen this in the senate hearings over the last year and there's been a rethinking about how we even think about free speech over the last year or two because of this and there's some people who suggest that we need to sort of even um take more seriously 
restrictions the way they might do in Germany. Like in Germany, there are laws against invoking Nazis and, and white, white power in a way that there are not here. Um, I don't know if that's the right view. I'm always more of a proponent of free speech than the last, but it, it's, uh, it's a problem. Uh, but, but Emily Bazelon had an essay in the uh, New York Times Magazine about a month ago that, that talked about the way some of these scholars are rethinking free speech in relation specifically to things like Facebook and these platforms. At the very least, I think they should be held accountable if they're putting out news, even if they're not the ones creating the news. And that's not currently the case. So that's, that's All right. <laughs> Over on the Facebook side of things, Joel, Joel asked us, or asked you, uh, what type of conspiracy theory would you classify the Trump claim of election fraud as? What kind? Oh, is it? Well, you mean from that, probably the three criteria of event or super conspiracy. Um, you know, insofar as, as it's something he claimed about the 2016 election and other elections, I suppose it would fall more into the super conspiracy. Um, you know, here's the trick, right? And, and <laughs> it's it's sort of sort of this new phrase is conspiracy without the theory. This is these newer works because there's not much theory there. It's just the sort of charge, right? Now, insofar as evidence is be being presented in courts, you know, look at the specific court cases. That's at least a reasonable spot to start looking at legitimate evidence. If the evidence there should be taken seriously, if not, but just a general proclamation that's a problem is not even evidence, it's not a theory. So, so I hesitate to even call it conspiracy theory. It's just a conspiracy sort of proposal, right? Um, so I think, you know, anyone who's serious, if, you know, if there are court cases, look at those, look at how they go. That's a reasonable place to adjudicate legitimate attempts at evidence, but tweets are not for anyone, not just for Trump, by the way, for me too. If I doubt a tweet, <laughs> don't, don't just take the tweet, right? You need to look at real work, so. That's why I don't tweet. <laughs> All right, uh, we're running out of time, but a couple, a couple, or actually one more that I see here. Uh, Emily asks again, uh, or asks another question. One, one more question. Have you seen the French Monumentary 2002? The what? <laughs> the the French Monumentary 2002. I have not. No. <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't do anything with that one, but. All right. Well, that is that's all we have from a, the, the question standpoint. I don't know if you had any uh, closing thoughts to leave us with. Um, I guess be careful. Being skeptical is not the same as believing an alternative to mainstream. You can be skeptical of mainstream views if, if you're you know if you're concerned about what you're getting in a mainstream source. Don't automatically jump over to another side. Just be skeptical look for the evidence and try to find reasonable sources of evidence that don't merely confirm what you already believe. Look at alternative views, listen to alternative sources of media, even if, you, if it doesn't make you feel happy. <laughs> it's, it's, it's intellectually good for you, even if it's not always good for your digestion. So you, you should, should do that. Um, it's not easy, but I think it's important if you wanna be a good thinker. So, and I wanna thank you all for having me out or wherever I am in virtual space. I appreciate it. So well well thank you very much Mark and we we appreciate you being here with us today uh, as well. Uh, to those of you that have tuned in, uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, stay tuned. We will have plenty more live uh, uh, features coming your way. Uh, just stay tuned to our Facebook page and we will make sure that you're aware of those when we when we put those out. Uh, thanks a lot and uh, have a great day. Thank you.